So welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for tuning in this afternoon. Um, it looks like we're going to have a few more people still filtering in, um, but in the interest of starting promptly, I will get us kicked off and, and others can join. Uh, my name is Catherine Shortliff. I'm the engagement manager with the trustees at Fruitlands Museum and really thrilled to have a great turnout for this afternoon program and um, a wonderful presentation prepared for you all today followed by some discussion. Um, this uh, I'm offering this welcome on behalf of both Fruitlands um, and the trustees as well as the Fitchburg Art Museum, um, our wonderful partner on this program. Um, so thank you for everyone who's tuning in, um, found out through either of those institutions and, and thank you to our, our colleagues at Fitchburg Art Museum. Um, today we will, uh, like I mentioned, start with a presentation and then um, kind of transition into some discussion time and have uh, some time for a question and answer for your questions from the audience. Uh, we may end up, this was scheduled until 3, um, we may end up running a little bit past 3 until around 3.15, um, so we hope that you'll stick with us, um, but if, if you have to sign off, of course, um, that is fine as well. And throughout the time, we have the question and answer box, um, kind of functional here. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you're welcome to type any questions in there, and that will send that uh, those questions to us, the panelists, and then I will come back in later in the program to help facilitate um, getting those questions answered for you. Um, so without further ado, I am going to pass off to uh, my colleague, Shana dumont -Cooper. Thank you, Catherine. Hello, welcome. I'm so um, happy to be with you all today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm the curator at Fruitlands Museum, and I wanted to um, first just let you all know as well that, and as well as being a collaboration with the Fitchburg Art Museum, this program also marks off um, a collaboration between the decor of a museum sculpt and sculpture park, Fitchburg Art Museum and Fruitlands Museum with the theme of Visionary New England. And so um, if any of you are curious about that, you could Google Visionary New England and I think a lot of other great programs and exhibitions will come up. I'd like to introduce Lisa Crossman, former Fitchburg Art Museum curator and now the curator of American Art and Art of the Americas at the Mead Art Museum at Amherst College. And also Maria Maltini, a multimedia visual artist based in Boston who creates conceptual, collaborative, socially engaged, mystical artwork that both connects and exceeds the traditional boundaries. So I also wanted to just say a note that this talk is being recorded. I'm going to begin with, um, first of all, if we could go to my first slide, please. I wanted to describe Maria's work and residency at Fruitlands Museum and just provide a little bit of a background and basis for Shaker history. Um, so Maria has been regularly visiting and working with Shakers, including living Shakers, for many years. And this is part of why I really have been following her career and have been just really thrilled to have her visit Fruitlands as an artist in residence since 2017. So we have been working together to build toward a site-specific project. Uh, so the Harvard Shaker Village, this is Harvard, Massachusetts, not the Harvard University campus, <laughs> that might be. Um, for people who are outside of Massachusetts joining us. Uh, Harvard is about an hour west or northwest of Boston. The Harvard Shaker Village was founded in the 1760s and it was the second Shaker community in the United States and the very first in Massachusetts. Mother Ann Lee, who founded the United Society of Believers or Shakers, she visited this group in 1781. Shakers regard Mother Ann as the vessel for the return of Christ's spirit to earth. They hold communal property and they're celibate and they view the founding of their sect as the beginning of the millennium 
otherwise known as the thousand year kingdom or reign of Christ on earth. And there's so much more that could be said, <laughs> but that's kind of a broad introduction to who the Shakers are. And so now I'll let you know a little bit about why are there Shakers in Shaker history at Fruitlands Museum. The Shaker office, which you see on the slide to the left, it's that yellow structure. It was built in 1794 and it was moved to its current location on the very steep hillside of Fruitlands Museum in 1920, so a hundred years ago, a century ago. Uh, it was moved there by museum founder Clara Endicott Sears, and it was the second building created specifically by the Shakers to serve as the place where they would conduct business with the public or the outer world. So why would they need a building like that, dedicated to meeting with people who are not Shaker? It's because they deliberately separated themselves from the world around them, and they believed that through work and prayer, they are creating a heaven on earth. So Shakers, meanwhile, although they were purposely separated from mainstream society, also engaged quite successfully in commerce with non-Shakers. By 1853, the Harvard Shakers manufactured and sold a wide variety of products, including brooms, and that's an important one that will come up later, brushes, dish mops, applesauce, pickles, seeds, and I could go on. There's a really long list. They were very successful with commerce. So Clara Sears gained the trust, friendship, and admiration of the Harvard Shaker sisters. And the image to the right is a small group of those sisters at the founding, the opening celebration of the museum in 1914. So a group of them came even before a, their Shaker office was moved there. They were there to just celebrate the opening of a museum that was at the time dedicated to transcendentalism and the uh, Fruitlands Commune. So their relationship, it was a friendship, it was an admiration, it even involved ghost stories. So ask me about that later. Um, it, as their friendship evolved, the Harvard Shaker sisters gave Clara Sears a trove of archival material as well as material culture. And so the relationship resulted in the first Shaker Museum in the world, which opened to the public in 1922. And now it's considered one of the galleries in a single museum that is still, thank goodness, open, Fruitlands Museum. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. I can't overstate how important I believe it is to have visual artists and really artists of all kind respond and create directly with the history that we hold. We planned, so Maria and I and a lot of other creative people have planned on a sculptural installation in that historic Shaker building that ultimately did need to change due to COVID-19. And we were able to formulate a new plan and a focus that involves a space clearing performance video in collaboration with the visual artist Allison Halter and filmmaker Gabe Elder. And in this work that I think Maria will be elaborating on a bit, but not, but the subject of this talk isn't only that, so it might not be um, a ton of information. Don't worry, Maria. <laughs> but just to say that she's considering this ongoing legacy of the sacred sheets or gift drawings that were made during the era of manifestations, which really peaked around the 1840s. And these gift drawings were made in secret, mostly by Shaker sisters who received direct inspiration from God. And part of the visual imagery that Maria has created that I find very powerful is um, using dyed and cut fabric to reference calligraphic lines that were part of these gift drawings and Shaker sacred sheets. So I'm going to leave it there. And now I wanted to turn to Lisa to introduce spiritualism and also Maria's beautiful work in the exhibition that Lisa curated after spiritualism, which is on view now at the Fitchburg Art Museum. Thank you so much, Shana, for that lovely introduction. And I'm going to very briefly give just kind of a, an overview of after spiritualism and talk about its framework and a brief introduction um, 
about spiritualism and Maria's um, beautiful work in this show. So after spiritualism, loss and transcendence in contemporary art is a group exhibition on display at the Fitchburg Art Museum through September 6th. It includes the work of 15 living artists, most of whom are based in New England. Maria is kindly going to flip through some slides um, while, I, while I just give this brief presentation. And unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about individual work, um, but I hope that the images give you a visual sense of the show and that they encourage you to um, look for more information online or go visit the show in person. After spiritualism is about loss, trauma, and hope. The work on view grapples with the way that loss and trauma persist in the present and the desire to communicate with those lost to us and with the past in order to make sense of and transcend current conditions. The show is divided into three thematic sections, historical hauntings, ritual and transformation, and sacred spaces. And spiritualism, a religion, philosophy, and science that developed in the United States in the mid 19th century and is still practiced today is the backbone of the show. Spiritualism notably centers on belief in the continuous life of the spirit and that the living can communicate with spirits of the deceased. While not unified in, the, in its politics, many, especially in its early years, sought reform. So women's rights, abolition of slavery, among other causes. Some artists in the show are spiritualists or have had direct experience with spiritualism, like Maria, um, or Puerto Rican Espiritismo, which is also woven into the show. But the show looks beyond spiritualism to consider the metaphor that spiritualism offers us. So whether or not you believe in it, um, it offers us sort of an opportunity to consider crossing boundaries and the desire for agency, especially in the midst of profound grief. And I'm using the word grief here really to describe the state that accompanies the loss of a loved one, but also grief that accompanies losses and traumas from various kinds of repression. The practice of spiritualism has spiked in times of great national or global unrest and massive loss of life, and notably here in the US after the Civil War. There are many winding and fascinating areas of exploration about the history of spiritualism in New England, ties to art and more that I would love to discuss. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to say a couple more words about Maria's installation at FAM and then um, turn our attention over to her. So I was really drawn to Maria's work because of her interest in the history of spiritualism her practice of it and the way that she integrates her philosophical consideration of spiritualism into her art. Maria's work connects with the ethos of reform of some early practitioners. She spends time in Lake Pleasant, Massachusetts, the site of an early spiritualist camp, which I'm sure she'll explain in greater detail. And Maria as an artist medium allows for us to see beyond what we're capable of seeing alone. And here you can see this um, beautiful image of an installation that she did for the Fitchburg Art Museum called Bauhaus Bauhaus. And it was inspired by an 1880 stereographic image of the Bauhaus or House of Bows, which was the first temporary construction at Lilydale, a spiritualist campsite in New York. And so Maria, I'm going to let you jump off from here and tell us about this artwork and also the conceptual framework for Double Vision. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Y'all can hear me, right? I forgot to mute myself, so <laughs> should be heard. Um, and thanks for everyone that I can't see who's here. I know that there's a lot of people that I love and collaborate with and others I've never met before. Um, you know, as, as many of you know, um, I'm at all times kind of juggling a lot of different ideas and thoughts. Um, and this, this lecture or artist talk conversation, whatever, is going to be a, a wild ride, <laughs> I think. Um, partially because that's how I, I think anyway, and just trying to, um, I'm not very, uh, I'm, I'm non-linear with the way that I think about these things, the way I research them, the way I present them. But on top of that, the fact that um, we are coming, or we're still in these COVID um, times, uh, it's just made all of my research, um, you know, even more uh, com complicated and confusing and given some extra time for some things and less time for other things. And 
you know, just changing direction with the way certain projects were going to go. So I'm going to be talking about work that is finished already and on display and work that I'm still in the progress in progress on. And then a little bit of um, uh, kind of like formal lecture style um, history about shakers and spiritualism peppered in there. So this is basically an artist talk, but I am going to be sharing some like raw and in some cases very new to me um, or like just recently gone back over research. So thanks for your patience um, as I try to get through some of this. Um, and I, I might read some things and I'll kind of freestyle other things um, just to try to stay on time here. Um, but yes, so here's the same image again of my piece Bauhaus Bauhaus um, at the Pittsburgh Art Museum. And um, I have basically been um, fascinated with the German Bauhaus and all of the um, artists that came out of the German Bauhaus and many of them that came to the United States to start um, places like Black Mountain College um, or like Walter Gropius who ended up in Massachusetts. Um, I actually, you know, I do feel like in the greater conversation of, a, of New England visionaries that is sort of the umbrella show for, for all of these shows. I've been calling these two the sister shows. Um, this sort of like utopian or visionary umbrella. Um, Bauhaus, um, the German Bauhaus does definitely fit under that as well because it was brought to Massachusetts and uh, with Gropius teaching at Harvard. Um, so I, I was it was exciting to get to bring that into this context as something I was already in love with. And, you know, part of why my research is so uh, wild sometimes is um, I do honestly um, sometimes intuit uh, facts or, um, or like a, in a certain context. Um, before I really read about it. And so sometimes that's even disorienting for myself because I have a certain idea or impression of a certain history that I was never certain or could point certainly to something I read that said that until I do read it. And I know, I think a lot of people have that experience, right? Like you read a thing and you're like, oh, I thought that, or um, I wanted to say that. Um, so with the Bauhaus, um, this was especially so. I've always kind of thought of the Bauhaus as almost like a spiritual movement, although I know most people associate it with brutalism, mass production, um, uh, you know, design, architecture, and um, sort of harsher, but still very much celebrated um, creative practices. Um, but yeah, for me, it's just when you think about um, all of the, the even the more well-known members who um, practice with the Bauhaus or taught the Bauhaus, you know, like Kandinsky um, or Paul Clay even, um, they had very spiritual practices as well. Um, and then, you know, Johannes Itten is a lesser known figure, but he was very important for the beginning um, of the Bauhaus and was um, very aggressively teaching um, like spiritual practices and, um, you know, using trance and uh, fasting and certain diets and um, a, a, a religion he, that was called Mazdaznan. Um, he was actually very actively um, implementing that into his lesson plans. And um, Gertrude Gruno, who is a lesser known um, Bauhaus uh, teacher, uh, had a huge role in, in the Bauhaus. And she, she taught um, her students how to, um, you know, see, see auras and intuit messages and um, hold um, energy in the body uh, in order to make your artwork. And she believed that you needed to tune, tune your body to, to its, um, its own spiritual like, frequency and environment in order to be um, an artist who's ready to create work in the world, art in the world. So um, there are people like Gertrude Grono and even Itten, um, but many more people that we never even talk about when we talk about the Bauhaus, and most of them women. Um, some of them uh, were like communist organizers with the school, others were um, uh, Jews who ended up being killed uh, in the war when the Nazis shut um, the Bauhaus down, and were actually some of, some of them were actually killed in concentration camps that were designed by their students, like by their, their peer students. Um, so it's like a very interesting um, time period, politically, 
spiritually. And that the, I'm kind of trying to make those connections with this body of work because spiritualism, even though it's not really a contemporary of the Bauhaus, like spiritualism was, you know, American spiritualism was founded or started, it is, it's said in 1848 in um, the burned over district in New York. Um, the German Bauhaus was started in 1919 and shut down in the 30s by the Nazis. So they're not even really contemporary to each other, but there are these overlaps that we don't think about. And I think with the Bauhaus, it's that it was actually, there was a lot more of a cult influence in the German Bauhaus than we know of. And with spiritualism, um, with early spiritualists especially, there are a lot of um, lesser known figures as well, many of them women and um, people of color, men and women of color. Um, who were very active, um, and again, with like feminism and abolition and other social reforms and political reforms. So I just thought it would be cool to try and find um, the overlap between uh, those histories. And um, I basically, uh, so, so as Lisa mentioned, the House of Bows or the Bow House was the first sort of temporary structure that was built for, um, for mediums to orate out of in Lilydale, New York, which is like the oldest, the other oldest um, uh, spiritualist community in the United States, with, along with Lake Pleasant, which I'm a member of. Lake Pleasant is in Massachusetts. Um, and this is, this stereograph image is the only, um, sort of information there really is about, um, about the, the House of Vows. And it was, I believe, um, built or the, it was first, um, the first trans lecture was performed out of it in 1880. And um, I just thought it was so fascinating and such a gorgeous image and um, so perfect because um, the stereograph in, in itself is this um, kind of like magical, you know, seemingly magical technology. It's like the first form of 3D technology. Um, and it's also an amazing metaphor for like looking at something through two different lenses or, um, you know, see, yeah, looking at two different histories or two different images that are just off of one another slightly and then seeing a more en enhanced um, final image. So I'm kind of using the stereograph as the basis for my talk and, and actually in this year, 2020, right, of double vision and I'm thinking about vision and thinking about glasses and thinking about um, binocular vision. Um, it's become really helpful for me to like think about my own artwork. Um, so I'm just going to go through this like pretty quickly, but I chose, so if the, if the bow house, if the house of bows um, again, like tree boughs, tree bow house um, was the first building you could say that was officially built under spiritualism. Um, the uh, house on horn was the first building uh, that was actually fully built at the bow house and it was for um, like Gropius's uh, sort of utopian imagined commune that wasn't didn't end up being built, but the house on the horn was built. Now this is not a stereograph. This is an isometric drawing um, made by Benita Koch. I think it's Koch. Koch. And um, I ended up turning it into a stereograph by, um, by like just measuring it and moving it over slightly and, and turning this image into a stereograph. This is just um, kind of showing that the sunflower is like the uh, symbol of spiritual, of, of American spiritualism. Um, and also the, that rainbow star that you saw on the right is Itun's color wheel star, color star. So I was kind of using those as like almost like the mascots or the emblems of each of these movements. Um, but then, uh, so what I did was printed this wallpaper with the help of um, Snake Hair Press, my awesome friend and collaborator, Jessica Caponegro. Um, and we printed the stereographs of the bow, of the, the House of Bows and the stereograph prints of the House on Horn as wallpapers. And the, this, is the, this is the one on the right side Oh, I kind of, oops, I mismatched it with it. So anyway, this is the House of Bows. This should be the House of Horn, but um, is, is on the, uh, the right side to show the German Bauhaus portion of the installation. And um, it was based on, um, Benit uh, this is Benita Koch Opta's um, oh, uh, drawing for a weaving. So that's, that's the pattern I followed. Um, you can see these a little bit closer up. And then I was just playing around a lot with like stereographs in my studio. Um, here, here's the House on Horn um, closer views of the sort of fabricated stereograph. 
So then on the other wall, um, based on Alti Berger, who, who was one of the um, amazing overlooked artists who was killed in World War II, um, this is a weaving that she did. So the, um, that side wallpaper is based on her design. And there's a sand stable in the middle that has um, a selection of stereographs that you can, well, before COVID times, you could th thumb through and get to look through both a Zeiss um, stereograph, which was kind of the more like Bauhaus World War II-ish era um, stereo stereo stereoscope. And the other is called the, um, uh, wait, I had it labeled up here. Well, anyway, oh, I forget. But, um, the other is more like the Victorian era stereo stereoscope. And here is a amazing uh, friend and, and medium or practitioner, psychic, psychic arts practitioner friend Grace um, sitting at the seance table. Um, but each of the stereographs has, I, I drew a little portrait um, in, in, so on a, like a sticky, um, a colored translucent sticky so it has almost like an auric, like an aura type feel to it of um, one of the member of either of these um, movements who has been overlooked. Um, and there's a lot of information on my website in the, the project about these people. So here are just some close-ups of um, just so you can see a little bit of the, the drawing quality. I'm trying to follow here on my other screen too. Um, but the idea is that yeah they're sort of like and it's almost like their ghost is kind of inhabiting that house you can sort of see through and even when you put the when you put it in the stereograph you get to see the sort of 3d more enhanced image of the the building with this sort of like floating figure over it so it's like kind of bringing these ghosts back to the, the seance table or whatever um back into the movement and I'm not going to go through all of them right now because um, there's a lot and I have a lot to get through, but this is all on my website. These are just like uh, from, in, I, I put a lot of stuff on Instagram. I talk a lot about my work, so you're welcome to follow me. And I post things like this a lot where I'll talk about the actual figures. Um, but yeah, many of them are queer. Many of them were organizers at the time. Many of them were Jewish um, women, um, trans folks that were part of the Bauhaus movement. This is, uh, I don't like the drawing I did of Gertrude Gruno, unfortunately, I, I need to redo it, but this is, um, this is like one of her uh, teaching models, like a drawing, so that's kind of a stand-in for Gruno. And um, then we have the spiritualist side, and um, you have the same, the same situation here. So um, this was William Cooper now, and this is Sojourner Truth. So both of those were African American or Black um, spiritualists. Um, William Cooper now um, was a huge, um, huge figure in the movement. Very close friends of um, Amy Post and Isaac Post, who were um, Quakers. Who um, they were Quakers who became abolitionists, but then sort of left um, left the Quakers and became spiritualists and. Um, host of a lot of um, open seances, like public seances with the Fox sisters, who a lot of people um, kind of attribute the beginning of spiritualism to. Um, problematic, but it's part of the narrative typically. Um, and, um, and then there are just these other amazing figures that again, if you want to look at my website or my, follow my Instagram, you can learn more about them individually. Um, and then this was just a funny thing I ran into, um, this, um, mystic, um, Paul Sidier, he's a friend, he was a French mystic, uh, an occultist during the Victorian era. He just made this, this diagram for how clairvoyance works. Um, and it, it kind of looks like the diagrams for how, um, the stereoscope functions. So I also love the stereoscope is kind of this extra, um, extra tool potentially for clairvoyance as well, or that you could use, yeah, that you could use a stereoscope or use these stereographs um, as a tool to practice your clairvoyance and see what else you might see through the lens. Um, so, you know, just looking at his, um, his diagram and then here's like a diagram for how um, stereoscope, stereoscopy works. Um, and again, the, the House of Vows. 
And this was lent to me um, by Lily Dale's uh, historian, Ron Nagy. He was very generous and enthusiastic to share this with me. I, I, I don't think this image has ever really been published. So this is like kind of a big deal. Um, I was holding, I was like holding it tight for a little while, but, um, and this is the like translation. Um, oh no, it's not. Oops. I, I wrote it in English somewhere else, <laughs> but it's, but um, I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to waste time trying to like translate it right now, but it basically describes how um, clairvoyance works. And it's sort of like, you see one image, you see another image, and then you have a different, you know, combined impression. And then I'm not going to go, this is just a lot of my other um, artwork that I, I'm just going to show as very quick examples of like when I, with a lot of my work, I bring very seemingly very different things together. And so I'm just so grateful to have found this, this um, 2020 tool to even like view my own um, work through. So like this is combining athletics and craft. Um, here I combine architecture and astrology. You can see that um, these are the, the birth charts for um, the Bauhaus, like when Walter Gropius signed the papers for the Bauhaus and the House of Bows when the first, um, the first trance lecture was performed. And they just have like these very interesting, cool A-frame housey shapes to them, <laughs> um, which we can, you know, investigate later with our clairvoyant tools. Um, this is combining the idea of the sea and the sky. Um, this is a basketball court in New Bedford that was kind of made and sort of inspired by Moby Dick and the, the sort of bleak whaling culture or history there. This is combining astrology and basketball. Um, the center of this basketball court uh, is the birth chart of the court, which uh, has an Aries moon and a Libra sun, which I do too. <laughs> it, just happened, it just happened that we were working on it during that time. Um, this uh, combines shipwreck and issues of gentrification. Um, this, I, I use quilting a lot and industrial materials um, to kind of talk about um, crafts and industry. Um, here's another example of that. This is a, some work, a body of work that talks about queerness and tennis. Ab exorcism and ab exercises the land and the body, shakers and honeybees, which has been a favorite topic of mine for quite a while and especially this year. Um, I've had a project going on. So I went to bee school in 2009 and I started visiting the first, um, or I started visiting the last of the living um, shakers at Sabbath Day Lake in Maine um, about 13 years ago. Um, so I think that was in 2007. So I kind of started studying them around the same time. And like, I think I had a bit of a fascination because both were sort of like, there was a bit of an alarmist vibe around like, oh, the bees are disappearing and like shakers are almost gone. And I was like, oh, I have to figure out what this is all about, like what they're about before they're gone kind of thing. And then you realize that anyway, you have more time than you think and people are being sort of an alarmist, even though there is you know, room for concern for sure, or a case for concern. But um, what I'm so fascinated by with um, shakers and honeybees is they're both these like matriarchal, but also kind of androgynous um, communal societies that do, uh, that engage in like labor intensive, um, yeah, repetitive labor, um, do ec and do ecstatic dancing and are like highly productive. And they also um, are, very important to metaphors around communism, or they are an example of like a communist or communal society, but they also um, engage very much or have been engaged um, with, uh, you know, our capitalist society um, and the, you know, market-based economy, like they, um, they're, they're highly productive. And um, so, there's just there's just all of these wild um, overlaps, and I have been doing a lot of research on that, and had planned to. Um, these are just some other past projects with about honeybees, but um, the sculpture that we had planned to do in the Shaker attic was actually going to be a, a living um, book of bees based on uh, a, a beehive designed by a blind beekeeper named Francis Hubert, a Swiss blind, bee, blind beekeeper, um, who designed the leaf hive, and it's leaf-like pages of a book. And I'm, I'm saying this now because the leaf comes up again. We are, we are not going to be doing the live hive because it's very, like, literally touchy, <laughs> and we're in not touchy times. 
at least not in that way. And so we've redirected it, but I'm kind of keeping this, um, as Shana mentioned, I'm gonna talk in a minute about it, but the sacred sheets, um, it's like we're still kind of keeping these like pages of a book or, um, or like the page is the sheet, is the leaf um, as related to the tree of life. So um, just, just representing a bit of the work that I, I was doing and you know, the shakers were beekeepers as well. And these are like these amazing beehives that were lent to me by Hancock Shaker Village, thanks to um, Sarah Pineo, the curator there. Um, and an amazing stereograph of Henry Blinn, who is gonna come up later, um, keeping bees. And this is just my favorite image of the shakers because it's like, they're like sporty. And then I often joke that, you know, the peach baskets are like shaker basketball hoops. It's like not even a joke, they, they would have been. But um, anyway, so this is like shaker PE. Um, and it just happens to be in a stereograph frame too, so. Um, I'm just gonna say a tiny bit about, my, I'm like interrupting the middle of my lecture to tell you a little bit about myself um, because I think it's important for you to sort of know how I, like my background, because I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I was raised Catholic. I went to Catholic school for 10 years. The Catholic church actually paid for like our schooling. Um, and like my, my dad had gone to the Catholic school, um, you know, before me. And it was just a big, big kind of weird community, right? Because most people, like most people in the South are, are Protestant. Um, like a lot of people are Christian, right? But um, to be Catholic is kind of its own, its own little separate community in a way. Um, and I was literally taught to play basketball by nuns. <laughs> and so it kind of um, gives me like this interesting uh, take on feminism and queerness and even like these, these, these um, issues of celibacy that come up when you talk about Catholic saints or you talk about the Shakers. And it's like, of course, a lot of that is really patriarchal and problematic, um, but also like maybe some of these people were virgins, like saints might have been virgins or um, people are celibate because we're forcing them to, but maybe they also like didn't want to dudes. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, sorry. Um, <laughs> and maybe they, you know, maybe they actually did have um, a, a, a really deep um, ecstatic passion about their spirituality that caused them to be committed to it rather than um, the other options and like a very, um, heteronormative society. Um, so it was kind of cool that these these nuns were like teaching me to play basketball. They were amazing at it. And um, I also come from um, farmers. So my this is my grandfather, Buford Ligon. Um, I don't have a, I wish I had a picture of my grandmother in there, but I come from like farmers and square dancers and quilters and beekeepers, like um, kind of country folk um, that have influenced a lot of my work as well. But one thing I'll say is that um, I don't have quite as much um, like Christian traumatic stuff left over as some people, <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit. But interestingly, I just like kind of always translated and translated it into what made sense to me. So I'm like showing this kind of funny um, image on the left of, um, I was very interested in the Trinity because I kind of saw it as like simultaneous simultaneity of identity. And of course I didn't have terms like queer or trans at the time, but I think that as a young kid, that was a little bit how I was thinking about it. Like, even though um, to say father, son is very patriarchal, it's also just like, you are your own parent, you are your own child. And then the Holy Spirit is this like other whole other thing. It's a force, it's an animal, it's a shape, it's abstract. Um, and it runs through everything. And so I just always really liked, um, you know, thinking about um, shapes and vision and spirituality and identity. Um, and I really liked the Trinity for that reason. And it was like a mystery that you just accepted. Like somehow this one thing was three things at the same time. And like that still just um, backs up the opinions I have about my life and culture now. <laughs> at least how I was able to see it as a kid. So I'm kind of posting this as a funny image of like these three kind of like white Jesus dudes, but it's like in my mind, I was like seeing it all as this crazy Hieronymus Bosch painting or something. Um, I wish I could find an equivalent Hieronymus Bosch, but. Um, oh, but so that kind of brings us to, um, to the Shakers again. Um, 
so we talked about like binaries in a way and we talked about the stereoscope as sort of like a way of seeing through two two directions to see a third so you kind of have like this trinity trinity thing happening but then we also have like lately we talk a lot about monoliths right we're like people people are not a monolith black people are not a monolith it's like what we're hearing a lot of right now it's really important to remember the shakers even with their one headstone for their entire community are not a monolith either. And that's why I really struggle to even give a lecture about them because um, they are visionary. And so they do have this kind of like overarching way of seeing the world and way of organizing themselves according to like big visions. But they're also very practical. And there were about, I think at their height, 19, 15 to 19 different um, Shaker villages. And at times they had like 500 people living in them. And so they had to make decisions, um, practical decisions day to day to just stay alive. And again, we're talking about like, like um, spirituality, communism and capitalism, like all of these matters um, to keep your society going. So people like to say that there are these big overarching truths about Shakers or these ways that they all lived. And it's just not really true. So I'm not really going to give you like a, this is exactly what shakers are, but I'll tell you a few little stories and to, you know, to um, show further. So this, this, um, this monument or this like unified gravestone is at um, Sabbath day, Sabbath day Lake, uh, where the, where the last three shakers are still living, brother Arnold and sister June. And actually, I'm sorry, sister Frances did pass away a few years ago, but in my mind, she's still there. Um, this is actually a brick from a little church that got torn down in South Boston that I left at this, at this tombstone. But, but here are two different um, Shaker graveyards. So you have Mother Anne Lee's headstone preserved, you know, very, very nicely for her and right next to her. Um, you have Lucy Wright, who was another sort of like mother um, of, of Shakers, of the Shakers. Um, and so those are in Watervliet or near the, near the Watervliet um, community. And then this is the Harvard Shaker Cemetery. They've got all these little lollipops marking individuals. So there's not really this one way that Shakers do anything. Another reason it's hard to like even talk about, I mean, I hate that I have to kind of glaze over this so quickly, but to talk about the origins of anything, particularly spiritualism, is so hard because where do you even start? Because ultimately we are talking about, even if we're talking about people who were like abolitionists and had radical views and were for equality and pacifism and which, you know, the Shakers were and the, and the Quakers were and the, the spiritualists came out of the Quakers, um, you know, there's still, it is still like a white culture, white supremacist culture, um, even if it's a peaceful culture, they are um, settling on land that they maybe did not take through violence, but someone before them did. So I just wanted to like put this map up just to say that um, that is definitely still a part of my research I want to go deeper into. And as I hopefully make like zines or write papers about some of my work, um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, whose land are these people on? Who's, and um, we've been talking about the Shakers. Um, they don't really call themselves a utopia. They call themselves, or they're, they're searching for heaven on earth. And so Shana and I have been like kind of batting back and forth ideas, like for say like a panel or something where we're like, well, who's heaven, uh, who's um, heaven is earth, right? Who is that for? So that's just like a side note, but um, Shana did mention a little bit about Ann Lee already, already. So, um, you know, and we are already running out of time. All right, getting there. But um, she, she had a really traumatic life. Uh, she grew up very poor in Manchester, England. Um, as, as far as the story goes that I know, she had like seven children, they all died. Um, she kind of decided that like factory labor and childbirth held like men and women back from their highest spiritual evolution and that that was just like no way to live. So she, um, she started this religion, um, the Shakers in England and came here to the United States in 1774 and settled in New York and the near where the community water, I think they say water bleat. I always wanna say water bleat, but I think it's water bleat is. And um, that was during a period that many refer to as a first great awakening um, when a lot of like Christian religions were sort of having these like evangelical revivals or awakenings. Um, and um, 
you know, when she came here, it, at first she was evangelical because she was trying to get a religion started. I mean, there were like seven people that came here with her. And um, she was seen, she was very charismatic. She was very connected to spirit. She had visions. She was, um, people were, like she was very magnetic. People were attracted to her. Many saw her as a witch. Many saw the Shakers as like perverts who, um, as they were claiming like celibacy and equality of men and women, like she, she called um, God, mother, father, God. She in, invented or within the religion at least, you know, created this idea of a, a two, two part Godhead that was um, father, uh, I have it written down somewhere, like father power, something power and um, holy mother wisdom. And I don't know if she at the time was claiming I am the second coming of Christ, but she ended up kind of being referred to that later on. Um, I've heard the Shakers, like the living Shakers, talk about the second coming in very metaphorical ways, as in like the sun comes again every day. Like there's always something coming. There's always a, a new day. Um, but some people also believe that like Mother and Lee, especially in this time where a lot of people did think the world was going to end, which the Shakers didn't I don't know they weren't like all on board but they were part of that culture so they did kind of see her as a second coming so um you know in in um pushing equality of of the genders like they were separate but equal like they with all the buildings that the shakers built um like hold on you know, had always had two entrances. Uh, women entered on the west and um, men entered on the east, but they were always facing each other, engaging one another, and um, did, you know, hours and hours and hours of group dances and were very, like, present in their bodies, which I think is really interesting because they definitely come out of kind of this Puritan um, culture and there certainly was some repression there. Um, but they also were, like, very present in their work, their day to day work, very present in their bodies. Um, they're, facing one another they're making decisions together and I think that and also they're they're like a Christian faith that recognizes the cardinal directions like there are just a lot of kind of peculiar things about them that make them truly different than I think a lot of Christian faiths especially that come out of that Puritan context um and let's see I like have these notes over here but um this will on the left is, is um, you know, a pamphlet that they made that kind of says what they stand for. And on the right is um, clips from um, Dan Graham's Rock My Religion, which is, like, I love that film so much. It's the best. Um, so you can kind of read those as I just list. So these were some of the basic Shaker principles I talked about. I talked about the mother, father, two part Godhead. Um, celibacy um, was important so that you could have like, well, for one thing, so you could be on the same page with everyone. They felt like you could only have true equality um, if, if, if it was simple, if things were simple. And so simplicity was a big part of their, um, their life too. Communal ownership of property, um, this idea of labor as, as prayer, labor and dance and movement and moving the body as prayer. So like um, Anne Lee coined hands to work, hearts to God. Um, they were pacifists, um, conscientious objectors. Um, they had direct contact with this contact with the spirit world and were like charismatic in that way and like plugged in and they believed you could have heaven on earth. So, um, and like, and then I have my little like adjacent takeaways, like they didn't necessarily claim these things, but I think that like queerness, um, and what, uh, a particular, this one writer I like, I like calls the androgynous ideal of the whole person is both male, has having both male and female characteristics. But queerness, feminism, they provided um, a place of sanctuary for a lot of people, particularly like widowed um, mothers and um, often like free black people as well. And um, they were into self-sufficiency. Um, but ultimately, Anne Lee did um, die from um, injuries. Like the, sh the early Shakers were beaten often because again, they were seen as perverts and witches and um, they were actually seen as challenging American freedom. And um, the, I, there was a, a house at the Harvard Shakers, um, like what's, what's now the Harvard Shaker land called the Square House. And the Square House was like this really important um, kind of place of asylum for the early Shakers where they would go when they um, were being attacked in Waterfleet. 
Um, so that area is really important. And the, the Shaker office is not the square house, but, um, and I don't have a photo of the square house, but it's just nearby. Um, and then this is just like one, another slide just to show that even though Shakers are into simplicity, they actually, um, their, their, their communities and all of their objects are very colorful. They have all sorts of um, ways of expressing themselves. They're, their furniture is often very simple, very functional, but they even have like some Victoria, Victorian style um, building and furniture as well. Um, and then this is the first book, the first Shaker book I ever bought. And it has all these beautiful um, drawings of their, their towns. And I just like the little star there because I think of that as being like an image of the Holy Spirit. Um, so these are just some images of the way they would do the dancing. They would dance in shapes for hours and hours and hours. Um, and again, like they weren't sexual, but they got a lot of energy out doing this. Um, this is the Sabbath day Lake Shaker meeting, meeting house, meeting room that um, I saw, I've been going to services in for about the last 13 years. Um, so this is still a very active meeting space. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. I'm gonna skip over this. Um, so, the era of manifestations is is the part of Shaker history that I'm really interested in because, basically, um, the Shakers were very were slightly evangelical during Mother Anne's time, but then the next generation, which um, let's see, it was called. Well, anyway, they have these sort of like generations and there was a generation later that didn't know Anne Lee and they spent a lot of time like organizing their villages and actually allowing them to be self-sustainable. Um, but then by the time you got to around like 1837, 1830s, which was the era of what we call in the United States a second great awakening, um, which a lot of um, my astrologer friends, like Lacey, who's probably in here, um, also points out that, out that that was in, uh, Neptune was in Pisces, which it is now, um, which sometimes um, attests to why we're all so interested in, um, in mystical again. But in 1837, um, the era of manifestations began. Many think because that generation of Shakers needed to be reconnected with the spirit of Anne Lee. Like they were kind of losing, they become so practical in their, in their um, communal living um, and just like keeping the communes alive that they were sort of losing some of the faith and losing that, that um, ecstatic connection, that ecstatic energy. So um, Anne Lee started appearing to Shakers and um, young Shakers in the way the the beginning of those days I don't think I really have time to read this right now but um, it, it, it sounds a lot like when you hear the early like Salem um, like the early hysteria and like young girls in Salem it like, sounds a little bit similar I mean they weren't they weren't concerned they were they believed what was happening but it was like younger children often younger women were starting to have these visions and messages um, from spirit and it turned out to be Anne and a lot of people of the first generation and it was a way for them to like actually have more direct contact with her and so um, these are like descriptions of um, of these these um, appearings beginning to happen and they were given messages that were often often in writing like people would write them down and then over time they became the gift drawings and they were considered gifts um, it was said that um, like in 1837, um, someone brought a box to um, Mount Lebanon Shaker Village. So most of this was happening right on the border of New York and Massachusetts between Hancock Shaker Village and Mount Lebanon Shaker Village and said that um, someone, a spirit showed up with a box of spectacles so that, that one could actually see the spirit. And so the Shakers put on these spectacles and there's all these very interesting descriptions that sound very concrete and you're not even sure you're like wait did someone really show up with the box of spectacles like could you touch the box of spectacles and there's a lot of descriptions of these um celestial valentines um like shakers would enter the meeting house and there would be these tables full of celestial valentines and they were literal maps of the hearts of each shaker front and back and they had their names on them and i don't know if I don't know how to describe what, what, what that really, what, what that was like in a concrete way, but, um, but Shakers ended up recording these visions, these, and these um, 
experiences. And so these are some of the celestial valentines. So like the writing kind of slowly turns into more figurative drawing, which they've never done before, except for the village drawings. And you have just, they're transcribing all these things from Anne Lee. There are all kinds of symbols. There's a lot of birds and feathers and trumpets and the, the, the drawings themselves are gifts, but they're also often depicting gifts that are being offered to them like in the heavenly, he heavenly realm. And sometimes Shaker's, an instrument, who is like basically the Shaker artist, is being given a gift actually for another Shaker. So like a lot of times they have these kind of wild um, titles, you know, it's like a gift for someone from someone for this purpose. <laughs> um, and, you know, here are just some more examples. Um, this is a sheet prepared and written according to Mother Anne's directions by Hester Ann Adams. The next is a gift from Mother Anne to Eldress Eunice by Polly Collins. I'm mostly, there are all kinds of wild drawings. I'm mostly showing you the ones that I've gotten to see with my own eyeballs at um, Hancock Shaker Village, um, which is, um, here's a lovely picture I took with what I think is a cool tree of life floating above. Um, so, th so this is a picture from Hancock Shaker Village. This is a picture from Mount Lebanon. So these are the two places that most of the um, drawings in the era of manifestations are happening. It's called the era of manifestations or mother's work. And um, Sister Polly Ann Reed drew a diagram of the Holy City that they ended up uh, creating the Mount Lebanon uh, village design based on that. Um, this is a type of a type of Mother Hannah's pocket handkerchief. And it's basically like a handkerchief that's supposed to have all of these gifts inside of it that are like promised for the afterlife. And a lot of times there, I don't think this one has it, but a lot of times they have like these beautiful mansions, like there are even these drawings of these beautiful mansions that have like eyeballs on the, at the top of the steps. And it's like the mansion that you'll live in once you um, get to heaven. And, and it's also like, but they keep reinforcing like with the holy city, they're like, well, we're living in the holy city. So it's all very like, they're already there. We're already in heaven. Heaven is on earth. We are going there. We're trying to go there, but we're also already there. And it's like reading about this stuff is just mind blowing. Um, this is the very um, famous tree of life. This is like the iconic shaker tree of life by Hannah Cahoon. Um, this one is the a Bower of Mulberry Trees, also by Hannah Cahoon. And then here we have some leaves. So this kind of connects back a bit to like the leaf hive um, that I was talking about, like a beehive where you can actually turn the pages of the beehive and it's like a book. Um, then they actually, this is a horrible image, I couldn't find a good one, but this is sort of like a funny family tree. And the Shakers ended up um, actually, <laughs> they started communicating with dead famous people that they believed had committed atrocities and were like waiting for the Shakers to absolve them so they could get into heaven. And like one of them was Christopher Columbus, for example. So there were like these, you know, these, like the whole, all the horrible white dudes that we're trying to rip down right now were like waiting to, yeah, to apologize for everything that they did. Um, so that the Shakers could like let them into heaven. So there's like these funny registers of some of these people that they were like, okay, you can go in now that you've you've like apologized for all these things you did. Um, so that was just like, so we're inching more towards not only are they communicating with Mother Anne and other, um, other members of past Shaker communities, but they're also starting to communicate with like other dead spirits. Um, and we're like basically at time. So, I mean, I was just, um, I was, I feel like I need to get to the most important part. So these are just like diagrams of their dancing that also look very similar to the way honey bee, honey bee dancing diagrams work. And, and the piece that we're going to do um, about the sacred sheets, which this, um, this uh, drawing from the era of manifestations, that's, um, you know, it's uh, spirit writing. It's like this abstract spirit writing. Um, these are the sacred sheets. And the piece that we're going to make now is going to kind of still build off of that honeybee shaker relationship of like the, the moving and the ecstatic dancing and the, the keeping of house. Um, but we're actually building the drawing out of cut paper. Um, and my collaborator, Allison Halter, who's an incredible um, artist and witch and broom maker, um, is working on the project with me that um, Gabe Elders, we're going to make a film of it. 
together. And um, so we've been cutting out these, um, these bits. There's Allison working on the brooms. Um, and we're going to create the sacred sheets on the floor of the shaker office and do like a kind of a space clearing ritual film. So we're like still in the middle of making that. So I don't even have a lot more to tell you about it anyway. But I just, I just think it's very important. We're out of time, but I can't end this without telling you about um, um, Rebecca Jackson, Rebecca Cox Jackson, because she was um, the most influential black shaker and, and one of the most influential black uh, female mystics um, in American history. And she, um, she had an incre incredible ability, um, like, you know, her visions and her inner voice responding to dreams and responding to her inner voice. And she started out as a, um, an African Methodist, um, like, you know, organizer, um, was definitely given a platform with other black women through, through the AME church, but um, ultimately um, left her husband and her brother and wanted more autonomy as a woman and also believed in celibacy because she thought she could actually commit more fully to her spiritual practice um, if she could be celibate and um, was met with a lot of resistance and even violence. Um, interestingly, so she was born in, I think it was like almost 1800. Um, yeah, 1795. And in 1840, she, or a little bit before 1840, she, she visited the water fleet shakers and she said these are my people like this is it this is what i've been looking for and she had a lot of spirit messages that confirmed that um she it wasn't like this totally perfect smoothest road but uh, but all the shakers were like were like uh she was very beloved and her her skills and her visions were um were celebrated, um, but she wanted to start her own community in Philadelphia. And she did believe that even though the Shakers were opposed to slavery and believed in equality, they weren't doing enough actively to, um, to uh, you know, find free black people and also just like evangelize what they were doing. But the Shakers had actually become very close during the era of manifestations because they were, they were well, they'd had a lot of trouble with the, with the world um, in the past, not accepting them and trying to shut them down for many, many generations. Um, but they were, they were, uh, their, their messages, the manifestations they were receiving were very vulnerable. I mean, they knew it was pretty radical that they were even getting them and that they were like making art or making visuals. So they had actually become more closed than ever. Like before that, they'd always welcomed people to their, um, to their services. Um, so it was kind of this like interesting time where they were closing in more and she's like, no, we need to be spreading this. And also she started hanging out with spiritualists and spiritualism was in Shakers were already starting to kind of like spiritualists were visiting Shakers. Shakers weren't really supposed to be going and hang out with people of the world much, but the ones who did a lot of the business were like allowed to go um, and do that. And they would, they would um, attend seances. They would, um, I, there's uh, accounts from H Henry Blinn, who is a pretty cool shaker that just uh, recorded a lot of things. And he actually wrote this whole document about spiritualism and shakers and started using a lot of the terminology, like before they'd said instruments and started actually calling some of the shakers mediums. Um, I, I was going to show you some of those slides, but it's just a little too much right now. But I just think it's really, really important to recognize Rebecca Cox Jackson for the work that she did because eventually she did get permission to open her own Shaker uh, village in Philadelphia. And um, it was a prominent black Shaker village and it wasn't only black, but it was, um, you know, it was dominant, it was dominant uh, black women. And also very interesting in this whole conversation of the stereograph, um, there is not a, a photograph of Rebecca Cox Jackson, um, but she, spent her entire life with like sort of her best friend her it, it was like it was like a wife partner daughter um person that there's been a lot of writing about like whether or not they were um in a romantic relationship but they both claim celibacy so but rebecca perot um actually once jackson once um cox jackson passed away rebecca perot actually changed her name to rebecca jackson and kept leading the um the philly shakers so um yeah and they and they just like they kept meeting the spiritualists and were more open to that and um 
you know, that was kind of the, the premise of a lot of my artwork is that, you know, I'm, I am sort of like a correct, I mean, I, I'm very engaged with the shakers. I don't just study them, you know, um, and I am a practicing spiritualist. And so um, I think often the shakers, a lot of these characters I've mentioned throughout the talk are overlooked in those histories, but also the shakers themselves are kind of overlooked in terms of like influencing spiritualism. Um, because a lot of people just start that story of the Cox sisters and that's problematic for its own own reasons of like maybe white supremacy and such, but also the shakers um, have been doing this for so long and they write about how people have been doing this for all of time, basically connecting the spirit and recording the visions. So um, yeah, that's basically, um, that's basically what I was going to share with you today. Um, I'll do this. I'll put, I was going to, I was just going to share this little project or this awesome project that I, um, is also in the um, Fitchburg show that I did with uh, Lacey Perpich Hedke, who is a spirit photographer and spiritualist. And um, we did this ectoplasm selfies project together that is also up um, in the museum. So if there is a little time, like 10 minutes for questions, um, I'll just kind of like flip through some of these. Um, thanks for letting me like motor through a lot of information. <laughs> I hope it was interesting and digestible <laughs> and gave a little bit of insight into my work. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. We do have pretty much exactly 10 minutes for some questions. So, um, and we've had some great ones come in. I, I know, um, Shana, did you have one you wanted to start with or? Well, no, I think we can go ahead and jump into uh, questions. Question? I've noticed oh. some really great ones came in too. So let's, uh, yeah. Absolutely awesome. So we have um, a couple of that I'll, I'll start with. And if we don't get to your question today, um, I, we, which we may not have time for all of them, um, please feel free to um, follow up um, and we can put you in, in touch with the right people. But um, I'll put my email in the chat box too if anyone wants to send in any further questions. Um, what? Matthew, yep. just to, sorry to interrupt you. I did want to mention that the ectoplasm selfies is also on view at Fruitlands Museum. So I would encourage you to come. Well, please go to Fishburg first. <laughs> and then we will be opening on September 5th. So for those of you who do might have to sign off, our exhibitions will open to the public on September 5th. And Maria's work at, Fish, at Fruitlands will not be on view at that moment, but two of her amazing publications will be there, including that one. So I'm sorry, Catherine, I just wanted to get that in and you can ask no the question problem. now. No problem. Um, I will mention with that, that the um, After Spiritualism at Fitchburg Art Museum is currently on view and closes on September 6th. So if you want to see that, you should do so more imminently. <laughs> um, all right, now uh, this question um, comes from Stacy. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about the structure of education and childbearing, uh, excuse me, child rearing <laughs> in this community. I love Maltini's point about how the Trinity allows us to see ourselves as our own parents. And also notice that many of the images she showed represented non-standard teaching scenes, i.e. the basketball court, art gallery, etc. I'd like to know more, um, if there's time. <laughs> One way to put it would be, what characterizes a shaker or spiritualist mother? Mother? Yes. Oh, that is a great question that I probably don't have a fast answer to, but I will say that you know my whole journey with the shakers has been almost like backwards like i went and visited them first didn't know what i was getting into or what it was, what it was about and i bought um sister francis's memoir and read it first so like you know one of the last shakers i presumably i read her memoir before i read anything else about them and um one of the things I was so impressed by was how she talked about children because they did take orphans and that's part, I mean, there's a lot of reasons that their population has dwindled, of course, but, but they're not really, they weren't allowed to take orphans after a certain time. So, um, 
so they, they, but they did have a lot of children around. And I, I just really like how she talked about how they worked with youth. And she, uh, Sister Frances kind of describes herself as like a um, difficult child and like who was getting into trouble a lot and, and like really needed a lot of extra care. And she, that's what she said that that was how they handled her was that they, they did give her extra care and sort of extra attention and like really instead of just, um, um, you know, instead of using punishment, right, they used love. Um, and again, like, shakers aren't a monolith, but I do think, um, I do think they have largely practiced like love and care and like genuine, um, sort of like genuine Christian values that a lot of people claim today, but clearly don't practice. So, maybe more about that later, but that was a really good observation because I work a lot with youth and that's like a really big part of my life and work too. Didn't realize I was muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, this next question is from Jay. Um, do you think there is a relationship between the Shakers embodied mediumship or spiritual practice and their inclination towards actually building communities, the physical manifestations of spiritual practice, perhaps in contrast to a more static spiritual pra practice, less of an emphasis on embodiment and movement, so less action in the world. Yeah, that's a really, that's a really great point too, because that's kind of, that's another um, thing, and that's just another thing I think is very special about them and that I like a lot about them because, you know, it's not really my place to speak about um, other, like, like spiritualist mediums um, because I don't, at least I have not honed that ability in such a way that many have, but like um, some of my friends who I know are probably on this call now, we, we talk a lot about being concerned about the bodies of people who are doing this like channeling work. Um, because yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're not moving your body, if you're not paying attention to your body, but your body is kind of like this vessel, then you start to, you can start to sort of lose it in a way. And, you know, one thing Rebecca Jackson didn't, she actually thought the shakers were a little too materialistic, um, which is fair or whatever. But I, but, but I think that's one thing that is so important about them is they are like grounded in their hands on labor and movement and I think that keeps them I think that keeps them healthier and I think it keeps um it allows for energy to like move you know and it allows for them to share things with the world that they otherwise separate themselves from I don't know if I answered that. like that was just like a great question for people to hear and I probably just don't have enough time to answer it properly but that's a really good observation about them, just like having an embodied practice in general, phys with physical objects and their bodies. And yeah, the community is, is a body and all of that. So they're very body conscious in a way. Yeah, that could be a, a much longer discussion. I'm sure. That's great. Um, all right, I think we have time for one more here. Um, this question is, is again for Maria. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts about contemporary witchcraft and mysticism and its connection to art practice and cultural transformation. Perhaps another very large question, but maybe a, a... Well, I mean, for me, it's like art is religion and art is magic. And I think I've always... I sometimes struggle a little bit in the art world because I mean, now, now people are opening up more to mysticism and magic. So it's like convenient. <laughs> um, but it's like, I just feel like I've always thought of it as, um, as, as magic and like, and, and I believe that art does change the energetic shape of the world. And I, I mean, maybe not all of it, but I think it has that, potential or maybe all of it you know maybe some people are in control of it in different ways um 
And I just think it's really cool. I feel really lucky to live in a time where um, it's, it's a little bit more accepted right now and encouraged because I'm, I'm able to like openly say, Hey, I'm going to paint a cell on like, you're going to pay me to paint a cell over there on the ground or whatever. And I don't have to really hide it anymore. And I think a lot of us on the call in past lives had to hide it or were punished for it. Um, uh and so yeah i don't know i just think it's a i think it is a cool time for contemporary witches and i think i think art is yeah is magic and and religion so perfect well i think that's all the time we have for today this was a wonderful and vibrant conversation and thank you everyone for your really thoughtful questions and um, thank you to Shana and Lisa and Maria. Thank you especially for this incredible presentation. Um, I hope everyone had a, a great time. And um, again, visit FAM, visit Fruitlands. Um, more information available on both of our websites. And um, thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks to everybody for calming my nerves this week. Bye-bye. <laughs>